sorry about that weird break and that uh, we're gonna have about four minutes left of the video in the chapter, but I had to go make my kids lunch and uh, I'm back now. So let's pick up where we left off. My dear boy, you are really beginning to moralize. You will soon be going about like the converted and the revivalist, warning people against all the sins of which you have grown tired. You are much too delightful to do that. Besides, it is no use. You and I are what we are and will be what we will be. As for being poisoned by a book, there is no such thing as that. Art has no influence upon action. It annihilates the desire to act. It is superbly sterile. The books that the world calls immoral are books that show the world its own shame, that is all. But we won't discuss literature. Come round tomorrow, I am going to ride at eleven. We might go together and I will take you to lunch afterward with Lady Branksome. She's a charming woman and wants to consult you about some tapestries she is thinking of buying. Mind you come. Or shall we lunch with our little duchess? She says she never sees you now. Perhaps you are tired of Gladys? I thought you would be. Her clever tongue gets on one's nerves. Well, in any case, be here at eleven. Must I really come, Harry? Certainly. The park is quite lovely now. I don't think there have been such lilacs since the year I met you. Very well. I'll be here at eleven, said Dorian. Good night, Harry. As he reached the door, he hesitated for a moment, as if he had something more to say. Then he sighed and went out. What was he going to say? We'll never know. That's the end of the chapter. But this is a really interesting sort of monologue by Lord Henry here that's not interrupted by Dorian. And it's worth analyzing, especially as it's the second to last chapter in the book. It's the last time we see Lord Henry, the Satan figure, and it brings a lot of those threads sort of together. So, um... Dorian is finding morality. He's trying to make a change in himself and become good. Um, and Lord Henry's response to this is, my dear boy, you really are beginning to moralize. You will soon be going about like the converted and the revivalist, warning people against all the sins of which you have grown tired. So cynical, but interesting nonetheless. This idea that the people who try and tell you how to be good are the people who have done the most evil and they quote unquote learn through their experience. But how can we take that information and, and apply it? Like doesn't their experience with evil invalidate their attempts to be good? You know, they, they've tried all these things and grown bored with them. And so now they tell you not to do them. That's not really fair. Um, and I think Lord Henry has a point here. Again, the reason he's such a convincing Satan figure is because a lot of the things that he says you know, they make some sense. Um, you got to have a, a, a villain like Thanos, somebody who, who is a, a little bit um, convincing, who makes you agree with their, their dangerous and immoral ideas because they're able to talk to you logically about them. Um, let's see. You are much too delightful to do that. Besides, it is no use. You and I are what we are. Again, I am what I am is a Bible quote referring to God and will be what we will be. So this idea that, that they are what they are, but also that, that they're unchangeable, that you can't suddenly become good, that, you know, like who you have become is who you have to be. And there's no altering it. There's a finality in what Lord Henry says here. Um, can people change? Maybe this is a question Oscar Wilde is trying to ask. Once you start down a path, can you change your path? Basil said so. He said, it's never too late. Let's, let's repent. And when he asked Dorian to repent, Dorian murdered him. Lord Henry says, there's nothing you can do to change. It's, it's, it wouldn't happen. Who's right? Um, as for being poisoned by a book, there is no such thing as that. Uh, then we get down to art. I mean, Lord Henry is bringing the art theme. I mean, the whole story is about art. That's um, Lord or Dor Oscar Wilde is, is an part of the aesthetic movement. He believes in art for art's sake. Um, and Lord Henry may be sort of a mouthpiece for some of his ideas. Uh, also, as we get into this, this book was, uh, it was declared an immoral book, right? And um, because of that, uh, a lot of what what said here becomes ironic. It wasn't ironic; it was written because this wasn't considered an immoral book by the public. Um, and I disagree. I've said a, a number of times. I think it's a supremely moral book. But 
go back to the preface where Oscar Wilde said, us, said to us very clearly, um, there is no such thing as an immoral book. Books are either well-written or badly written, that is all. Uh, Lord Henry says, um, there's no such thing as being poisoned by a book. And then he follows it up with, art has no influence upon action. Which begs the question, what influence upon action does art have? What influence did the picture have on the choices Dorian made in his life? Um, his, his viewing life as art, uh, exempting him from consequences for his own actions. Did that have an effect on his life? Is art sterile? Or is it more than that? Does it plant suggestions and seeds that change the way that we interact as human beings? Is it just a tool, a sterile implement, or is it something that has ideas and ideologies and lives of its own that therefore can in fact or poison or assist a human being? I'm not going to give you an answer to that. What is Wilde's answer? That's something for you to think about. So he says, art has no influence upon action. It annihilates the desire to act. Is that true? It is superbly sterile. The books that the world call immoral are books that show the world its own shame. Again, this book was called immoral after it was written. Does it show the world its own shame? Certainly it shows the Victorian world its own shame. Has it lost some of its power because it's, it's so old now? Or in America today, are there elements of Dorian Gray that, that still ring true? Um, that is all, but we won't discuss literature. And then Lord Henry, you know, like goes on about wanting to hang out with Dorian. Lord Henry's lost his wife. Um, she's divorced him. And uh, it seems like Dorian's just about his only friend. He's lonely. You know, for the first time, we see sort of a little bit of frailty in Lord Henry's character. Um, he seems so sure and so decisive and all of those things throughout the entire story. Now we see him almost begging for Dorian to hang with him. It's very much what Basil was doing when Dorian was leaving his company early in the story. And Dorian doesn't really care to be with Henry anymore. Must I really come and see you tomorrow? Oh. Um, I think this humanizes Lord Henry a little bit, maybe makes you feel a little bit sorry for him, despite the fact that he's a horrible douchebag of a, you know, a woman hating um, human being. Whatever. Uh, that'll be the end of the chapter. We're going to hit the last chapter here. I'll probably just stop this video and then start it up and do the next video because... Uh, the last chapter is short and powerful. So, see you in just a second.